Hello and welcome. I'm, um, I'd like to introduce Gail Anderson Dargatz, an, inter an international bestseller. Hello, Gail. Hi. Hi, Lisa. How are you doing? Very good. And the writer in residence for the Alberta um, Writers Guild for the, since January, correct? Yeah, it's five months. Yeah. Oh, congratulations. And what a, what a gift to uh, Alberta writers. Well, thank you for saying that. So before we begin, let me introduce Gail Anderson Dargatz. Her international bestsellers, The Cure for Death by Lightning and A Recipe for Bees, were both finalists for the Scotia Giller Prize, among other awards. A Recipe for Bees was also nominated for the Impact Dublin Literary Award. The Spawning Grounds was nominated for the Sunburst Award for Excellence in Canadian Literature of the Fantastic, the Ontario Library Association Evergreen Award, and was shortlisted for the Canadian Authors Association Literary Award for Fiction. Her very first book, The Miss Hereford Stories, was shortlisted for the Stephen Laycock Humor Award. Her new novel, The Almost Wife, a commercial thriller, hit the Canadian bestsellers list this past year. Her next thriller, The Almost Widow, is out with HarperCollins next spring. Gail also writes young adult and high-low books for the educational market. Her book, Iggy's World, was a Junior Literary Guild Gold Standard selection and shortlisted for the Chocolate Lily Book Awards. The Ride Home was shortlisted for a BC and Yukon Book Prize, the Sheila A. Egoff Children's Literature Prize, as well as the Red Cedar Fiction Award and the Chocolate Lily Book Award. Gail began her career as a poet and a short story writer with works published in many literary magazines, including Queen's Quarterly, The Malahat Review, Prism International, Canadian Fiction Magazine, Prairie Fire, and A Room of One's Own. As a young woman, she worked as a small town newspaper reporter, photographer, and cartoonist. And throughout the years, her nonfiction pieces have been published in many publications, including The Globe and Mail, Chatelaine, House and Home, Quill and Choir, Reed Magazine, and Western Living. A Chatelaine piece was shortlisted in the National Magazine Awards. Gail taught in the University of British Columbia Creative Writing MFA Optional Residency Program for nearly a decade and has presented workshops and retreats across the country. She now offers developmental edits and mentors writers on her online teaching. Well, wow, that was a mouthful. <laughs> that was what a contribution to the literary landscape, the Canadian literary landscape. Um, we could talk for hours about uh, what you know um, about writing and the writing process. Or what I don't and know. Too. Yeah. And what yeah. you don't know, which is, I think, probably perhaps maybe what fuels you at this point in your yeah. career. Yeah, it sure does. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, but let's talk about um, specifically your time as writer in residence with the Alberta, um, the, the Writers Guild of Alberta. Um, you're just completing your term. Yep. And let's talk about how it went. So I'm curious how many manuscripts you read, how many conversations you had, and the types of manuscripts you read. Well, there were 46 uh, sessions altogether. So that's 46 uh, manuscripts that I read over that time. And uh, most of them were over Zoom, as you'd expect these mm -hmm. days, um, all kinds of projects. Most of them were fiction, mm -hmm. uh, but also memoir and poetry. Um, fiction projects spanned all genres from literary to commercial fiction. Uh, from sci-fi and fantasy to thrillers and detective fiction as well. So just right across the board, uh, which was exciting for me, you know, to see so many different kinds of writers um, at so many different levels. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's frankly what I'm used to, though. I mean, I've been teaching for a great many years and I teach, you know, right across from newbies to experienced writers. So um, it was what I expected. And, but it was still thrilling to see the quality of the writing that was coming out of uh, the Guild. It really was. Excellent. Um, so who were the writers who took this opportunity 
to have you read and provide feedback. Um, like what was their, what was their age? Do you have a sense of their age range? Oh, you yeah. Said experience I mean, experience was, you know, all over the map and, and even location in Alberta. Yeah, it was right across the board from 20 somethings to seniors and from newbies to again, experienced writers and from all over the province. Uh, most of them were in Edmonton and Calgary, again, as you'd probably expect. And uh, again, for me, it was really wonderful to meet up with so many writers that I had worked with before, okay. but also, of course, to meet uh, so many new faces as well. And I think uh, coming at the tail end of the pandemic wave as it was, um, I think everybody appreciated the opportunity to be social. I sure did, right? Um, so aside from talking about any given project, um, it was wonderful just to chat with other writers, especially at the time when uh, many of us were still stuck in our homes, you know, and doing our thing. So it was, uh, it was really a lot of fun. Can you give us a sense, I mean, it's, it's too late now, but just out of interest sake, for those who maybe have never approached a writer in residence and they're watching this and um, considering it, um, what was the, the page length and um, that, that uh, people could send you, writers could send you? Well, it, it varies given on, you know, any given writer in residency, uh, but in our case, it was roughly about 4,000 words or 15 uh, pages. Okay. Uh, so, you know, fairly short and sweet. You only have an hour uh, to discuss okay. it. But, um, you know, with an experienced writer, uh, you know, can tell a lot from that short piece about what's going on in terms of craft and problem areas. So, uh, so it's more than enough to get a sense of what's happening in a project, particularly if you get something in the way of a synopsis. And of course, many writers did offer a synopsis or a brief outline with nice. the work. Yeah. Okay. And so then, then they got an hour of your actual face-to-face -face time besides the work that you put on the Yeah. Manuscript. Yeah. And I also made yeah. a point of giving, um, you know, a, a really good detailed notes along with it. So um, for me, from my end, it, it was quite a lot of work, uh, frankly, yes. but, but uh, I really enjoyed it. And I think uh, most writers really got a lot out of it as well, because I gave a lot of resources, including links to outside um, resources as well. Yeah, I, I would imagine, especially, I mean, you've been, I mean, you were with um, UBC for a decade, nearly a decade. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this has been a big part of your career. Um, oh, yeah, well, I've been teaching for, it's been mentoring in some form or another, just about 30 years now. So, yeah, so it's, uh, I, I think I'm at the stage now where I'm, I'm still writing and still love it, of course, and still doing new projects. Um, but yeah. Um, I'm at the time in my career where I'm passing on the torch. And that's really the more exciting part now is seeing other writers uh, develop and uh, find their own voice and their own stories. Well, piggybacking off of that, um, I know teachers and mentors often learn from those they mentor. Um, is there anything that you will take away from this experience specifically as something you learned or a new perspective gained um, either as a mentor or an editor that one of these Alberta writers um, you know, offered to you as part of your interaction with them? Oh, you know, honestly, I, I, I literally work uh, or learn from the writers I work with every day. In fact, uh, this next um, book that I have coming out uh, next spring, I've dedicated it to the writers I work with and said, you know, you teach me every day. And, it, and it's really true. Um, I, 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 I come out of every workshop session slapping my forehead going, oh, crap, I'm doing the same damn thing, right? So I'll, so I'll you know, talk to the writer I'm working with and brainstorm with them and realize that, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with the same issues. And I think that says so much about the process that we do all deal with the same issues, even if we're, you know, experienced writers, we're still running into many of the same problems that you know, newbie writers are working with, especially in our discovery drafts. Um, I think the biggest thing that I learned, though, is comes in the form of perspective. Um, um, because, it, again, it makes it, every day that I teach, it makes it clear just how much I still have to learn, even after 30 years of, you know, mentoring and teaching and, and being mentored myself. So it's, you know, it's one of those... Um, uh, you know, occupations or crafts where we never, ever stop learning. And, um, and the other thing, too, is that I'm no longer protective of my work. You know, my ego has taken a back seat. Uh, I think early on, we we're very protective of our, 
of our manuscripts and um, uh, you know, we don't like to hear criticism and I'm, you know, I'm just so past that now it's not funny because, um, you know, if my editor says there's a problem I know there is right. Mm -hmm. uh, because I see it, I see all the possible uh, conceivable problems in the manuscripts of the writers I work with so, so that's a big thing I just, um, I'm no longer you know, defensive or protective of my work, I just kind of go, oh, yeah, okay, and it gets exciting. And that's the wonderful <laughs> thing about reaching this point in my career where um, getting critique is actually exciting, and it, it enlivens the work. So I think that's the biggest thing that I get from uh, working with uh, other writers. You know, I have to say, um, from somebody who, um, you know, has been a finalist for the Giller Prize, not once, but twice, um, to have you say that there's still so much to learn and that you still grapple with what those writers who are starting off in their writing career grapple with. Um, you know, I think that gives us writers a bit of hope that, um, that we're all in this together and that we, you know, the conversations are important and seeking mentorship is important um, yeah. because the, a writer is a writer and a story is a story. I mean, there are different kinds, but um, but that that you that you're still seeking to grow and to become better. And that I mean, I think the sign of any good mentor or teacher is one that says well, yeah, that they are willing to learn and especially from those that come to work with them. So yeah, and I think it's really important to I mean you're really talking about um, finding your community yes. and that's so important for a writer because it, it you know it, it it's uh it can be a really isolating uh occupation yeah. and it's easy to believe that you're the only one dealing with these problems mm -hmm. until you talk to another writer and yeah. then you then you quickly realize that we're all dealing with the same problems we're all working through those same uh issues and that's really important so that's why belonging to um, an organization like the writers guild of alberta is really important so that uh, you are in touch with other writers that you can talk about those problem areas not just craft stuff you know it's about um everything about the writer's life you know from finding uh time to work uh to dealing with the financial end of it you know to the business end of it all of that so it's really really important to make those connections and realize that uh, again we all deal with the same problems you know and that's just uh and we all deal with self-doubt right i oh, mean yeah. that's a big one I've been at this for so many years and I've had, you know, I've got so many books under my belt and I've been teaching for so many years and I still wake, you know, at 2.30 in the morning, you know, what is that going, oh my God, oh my God, what have I done? And that never goes away, you know, uh, and I, I, I think it's just something we have to deal with and understand that um, maybe that self-doubt is necessary. Maybe it drives us and keeps us um, mm -hmm. moving forward, right? Uh, as long as it doesn't stop us, yes. you know, and that's, yeah. that's the big the thing. Healthy, we allow, the yeah. healthy amount of... A healthy amount. Yeah. yeah. It only yeah. wakes you once in the night, not twice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I look forward to talking more about the, the, um, the writer's life in a moment. But the question I have uh, in reviewing your, um, you know, invitation um, video for when you started this, um, be becoming the writer in residence, you invited people to submit their crap to you and you just use the word crap. And I thought about that for a while because on one hand, as a writer, I think oh, I have the chance to work with such a prolific, um, important, smart, um, you know, writer, do I want to if this is the only interaction I would have with you, would I want to present my crap to you and then have you think, oh, I remember Lisa Murphy Lamb. Yeah, that was crap she sent in. Um, <laughs> and so if that was our only interaction. Or on the other hand, is, does it give permission for people who have that self-doubt, who wake up, who is like, okay, maybe this is crap. But Gail said I can send it in, and so I paused, and so I, I sent I passed this to you when you when you say this. Um, does it give permission for people to just to writers to take that maybe leap of faith 
and interact with um, a mentor that maybe they admire, you know, who they've read every book of, who they cheered for awards, um, to present um, their work mm -hmm. with, because it cannot be, it doesn't have to be perfect work. Yeah, well, you know, and, and writers tend to be perfectionists. I mean, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's again, what drives us. And it's really tough to show your work to other people. I yes. mean, that's really scary, right? Mm -hmm. um, so when I'm working with a writer, I, you know, I make a point of being honest, but really encouraging because of that, because it's a really scary thing to do. And of course, we want to work and work and work our stuff before we show it to anyone. And, you know, we, it, it's hard to let go, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's really important to get used to just throwing your ideas to the page in a discovery draft. So in other words, write crap. Um, and we have to feel okay about doing that. Uh, and more, we have to feel okay about brainstorming over our crap with others in the workshopping process. So at some point, all writers have to enter a workshopping process. It's, it's just part of what it is to be a writer. And writing itself is a process, of course. Uh, as we work and work the story over time. So, you know, um, uh, my job as a mentor is to take that crap and <laughs> um, find the nugget of, you know, or seed of a, of a good project in that initial um, discovery draft. I'm looking for energy or a good idea or premise or a strong character or something that we can brainstorm over. And frankly, if, um, you know, if writers send their crap first before they ever get into the polishing stage, it will save them so much time and grief, right? Because um, an experienced, you know, mentor can uh, point out potential um, problem areas that they're likely to face in that discovery draft before you ever get to the point where you're polishing it. And I, I think maybe that's the most common uh, problem that I see that writers are afraid to, to uh, brainstorm or workshop their work at the point that they really need to before they've put in all that time and effort of yeah. sculpting it and polishing it so that really they're, they're polishing problems, right? Rather than fixing the problems. So, so my job is to, you know, uh, point, point those problems out uh, in the um, manuscript in a loving way, um, because it's usually about conflict avoidance. Um, as writers, uh, you know, our, our personality makeup makes us uh, people who tend to avoid conflict in our personal lives, and we certainly do it on the page as well, uh, because it makes us uncomfortable. So we hold uh, events uh, at arm's length in our writing. Uh, in the past in unnecessary flashback, or we write too much exposition rather than writing in full scene, because if we write in full scene, we experience it and that makes us uncomfortable. Or we don't allow our protagonists to speak or act. In other words, we render them passive. Uh, so they only observe and report on other people's conflicts as we do as writers, because we're observers, right? We stand back and observe other people or the characters are alone and ruminating rather than actively engaged in their conflict. So there's all kinds of ways that we avoid conflict on the page. And my job is to point that out and then help the writer to rethink situations so that they're putting their protagonist right in the center of the conflict and then developing it. So, uh, so again, if, if I can get to that writing at the earlier stage, then I can help the writer, you know, um, avoid all those common problems and uh, rethink situation and get their character much more active before they ever get to the polishing stage. So that's why it's really important to get used to the idea of just handing over your crap and, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and saying, here, what do you think I can do about this, right? Yeah. Uh, and getting used to that, right? And, and learning not to be afraid to do that because that's just the, that's the writing process. It's the workshopping process. Gail, I really appreciate that answer. Um, I, that that is uh, that really unpacked it for me, and and I hope um, for anybody who, you know, who has not um, tried the mentorship um, opportunity, mm -hmm. that after hearing you talk so gently and so 
intelligently about what might happen when you hand over 15 pages that um, a writer might take a leap of faith. That was a beautiful answer and I really appreciate it. Uh, so you had 46 sessions of gifts, I, I'm thinking, to 46 writers um, over the last few months. And which was your role as a virtual writer in residence? Um, sometimes mentorship programs um, also build in time for writing, but this was a, a mentorship manuscript consultation yep. um, role. Did you have time to write over the past five months? Yeah, that, that's a thing, right? Um, uh, what I had to do was set some boundaries. And so I confined uh, the writer in residence sessions to my weekends, basically. So I booked them in Saturday, Sunday, Monday, which meant that for the rest of the week, that was supposed to be right writing. But of course, I went into my work week tired, because as anyone will mm -hmm. tell you, you know, the Zoom session alone is... Yeah is difficult, much less all the work that goes into a blue pencil session. So that was an issue. Uh, I did write less over that time. It did eat into my work time quite a bit. Um, having said that, I really, really enjoyed it. And it did keep me social at a time when it was difficult to be social. So that was huge for me personally. Um, but I did get my next you know, book out there. Um, I did finish most of the editing during that time. So I did get that going. Um, uh, normally, though, I would be working on a second project. So I'm, I'm now getting to that. So, uh, you know, now that I've, I've finished the writer in residency. So yeah, it does, it does impact the, um, you know, the amount of energy you have for writing, there's no doubt about it. So that's, that's always a juggle for me, though, as I mentor and teach. And oh, I yeah. also, I also do developmental editing. So, you know, that's just a constant juggle that I've grown used to over the years. And, uh, yeah, so it, it comes down to setting boundaries and having designated writing times and designated teaching times and trying to keep them as separate as I can. But, you know, use the same kind of energy uh, in, um, you know, editing and teaching that you do in writing. So, do you? you know, so there's only so much that you can, um, you know, do in a day. Keep in mind, most, most of what you do in writing is self-editing. Yeah. So, you know, it's rewriting. Mm -hmm. It's self-editing. So that's very similar to the process that I go through uh, as a mentor. And uh, I basically critique my own work in the same way that I critique other people's work. I learn, I've learned to distance myself from it and go, okay, now I'm self-editing. I put on my editor's hat and I edit my own work, you know, and. And I almost imagine your, your mind being split at least in two. And so how could you not be like editing and looking for all of those um, characteristics of a story and conflict on somebody else's work without having your own work, you know, hanging out on the side, listening in to see if there's any problems you can solve on your own work as well. Are you able well, to completely or no, I, I, you know, if I'm working on a given manuscript, I have to focus on that manuscript and I have to put my own writing to the side. Uh -huh. um, but I am using the same kind of, you know, mental energy uh, yeah. for both. Um, and that's um, why I also, um, you know, put uh, physical activity into my writing day as part of my writing day because, um, you know, we just need to move, right? Yeah. But also ideas percolate um, yeah. through physical, repetitive physical activity. So walking or gardening, or this past week I was painting my kitchen walls. So that physical, um, repetitive physical activity really helps kind of uh, jog the ideas. And, you know, it's, um, it's the old three, three B's of scientific discovery, you know, where scientists would make their eureka moments. And that's, you know, the bedroom, the bathroom and the bus. So it's places where we, you know, we shut down our brains and, you know, um, and that's where the ideas percolate up, right? So I do my work in the day and then... One. Yeah, and then I do my work in the day, and then I um, try to do something mindless and repetitive, and that's where the good ideas percolate up for the next day, and that really helps a lot. Oh, thank you for sharing that. I love the three Bs, and then also how you take that and um, activate it yourself. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for talking about um, 
you know, giving us a glimpse into what you um, contributed to the Writers Guild and, and those um, writers who um, sought you out for mentorship. I'm wondering if you would like to read us something. Sure. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll read a section from The Almost Wife. And um, in a lot of ways, this was uh, quite a departure for me. It's um, set on Manitoulin Island, um, which is in Ontario. Uh, most of my books so far have been set in BC or Alberta. And um, the reason for that is my husband and I um, had a uh, house in uh, on Manitoulin Island and that sounds very fancy to have two houses but it just meant we had two crappy old houses that the bank owned that we could never get around to renovating right it was one of those situations the reason we had it there is uh, Mitch's mom and his family was there so it was a gathering place for family and I did retreats there for many years so uh, you know the joke was uh, you know people would ask me are you ever going to write about Manitoulin and I would always say you know not until I leave right because I'm sure the locals would you know <laughs> be upset with me um, but and and as it turned out that's exactly what happened when we you know um, you know my husband's mother died and we finally gave up the place um, uh, and up writing about Manitoulin Island and at the same time, I was looking at doing something different. I think we all reach a point in our careers, no matter what our career is, where we just need to do something different uh, to keep it alive and fresh. And that was true for me. So uh, I talked to my agent about writing uh, domestic thrillers, which is, you know, over here from writing literary. And she said, sure, which surprised me. Um, but uh, I really enjoy the thriller structure. It's a really cool structure to work with and a lot of fun. And so um, this was a result. I wrote a domestic thriller. And um, in this uh, particular scene, I'm going to read here, the protagonist, Kira, uh, is being stalked by uh, her fiance's ex, Madison, who's trying to get to her fiance's daughter named Olive. And in the action of the scene, it takes place at the iconic swing bridge. For any of you who know anything about Manitoulin Island, there's this amazing swing bridge there. So this is uh, chapter seven, and it's fairly short, and it just gives a flavor of the uh, domestic thriller. <clears throat> Excuse me. I gripped the steering wheel as I waited for the swing bridge to close. Behind us, cars lined up one after the other. Tourists and haw eaters, locals born there, named after the haw berries that grew on Manitoulin, heading to the island to hang out in cottages for the holiday. Even when the bridge wasn't swung out of the way for water traffic, there was always a line up here in summer. Drivers stopped by the lights on either side of the bridge as the deck was only wide enough for single lane traffic. Other than the ferry that ran between South Baymouth and Tobermory from May to October, and not at all in winter, this was the only way on and off the island. There was talk now of replacing the century-old bridge with a new structure. My God, Madison was here in my home territory. I should text Nathan, warn him. I tapped on our conversation. But what would I say? I'm here after all. Oh, and by the way, I brought Aaron's daughter and his crazy ex is here too. A family vacation. I tossed the phone back to the seat without sending him a message. I would just have to find a way to talk to him alone tonight. Have you ever seen a swing bridge in operation before? I asked all of trying to make chit chat, trying to ease my nerves. I think this one at Little Current is one of the last on the continent, if not the last. I cringed at my chipper, informative voice. I sounded like a teacher. No, I sounded like a mom. I expected Olive to roll her eyes and snort, but she leaned forward and peered over my shoulder at the bridge. It was surreal, swinging back towards us like a giant art installation. How long are we stuck here, Olive asked. We should be on our way shortly, I said. <clears throat> Excuse me. As soon as the bridge clicks back into place. It was just about there now. I picked up my phone. There were more texts from Madison, but I wouldn't look at them. I wouldn't. I looked. Stop ignoring me, Madison had texted. 
I have to talk to Olive, please. Let's meet somewhere. Like that was going to happen. I caught Olive staring back at me through the rear view mirror with a haunted expression. My phone buzzed again, and so did Olive's, but neither of us glanced away, an acknowledgement that we were both receiving harassing texts from Madison. Olive seemed to be asking me for something that she couldn't bring herself to say out loud. I should have asked what she wanted from me, what she needed. She finally looked down to read the text, and so did I. Fine, then, Madison had texted me. Ignore me, face the consequences. Olive thumped her head back against the seat. Then she leaned over to kiss Evie, her eyes moist with emotion. What's going on? I asked her. She grabbed her athletic bag and, after taking a last look at Evie, flung open the door and jumped out of the pickup. The line of vehicles ahead of us was already starting to roll onto the bridge. God damn it. I got out of the truck, but hesitant to leave Evie, I yelled out, Olive, what in the hell are you doing? Come back here right now. Olive raised a hand to a car to get it to stop so she could cross the road. Then she jogged at a brisk, brisk pace down the shoulder, past a line of waiting cars, heading towards a gray minivan that was parked facing back to Espanola and Sudbury. Madison. It must be Madison. I quickly pulled the rental to the side of the road, flicked on the hazard lights, and slammed the door shut as the car behind me pulled out onto the other lane to pass. Mum, mum. Evie asked through the open truck window, reaching for me, her eyes wide with panic. I'll be right back, sweetheart. I crossed the road in front of a Rio that honked at me and sprinted down the shoulder as the cars in line slowly drove by. I was much fitter and faster than Olive, who spent her time in front of, in front of one screen or another. But she had a head start, and she jumped into the van before I reached her. The van started moving. Hey, I shouted, waving both hands over my head as I ran after it. Hey, stop. But the van picked up speed, taking all of farther and farther away from me. So there, that's a bit of a taste. Thank you. No, oh, you're welcome. Um, ah, yeah, thank you. It's, oh, it's an enticing part of your book to see what else is going to happen <laughs> in that and then is the follow-up um the the follow-up that you've just been working on right now the almost widow mm -hmm. is it connected no it's not it's a whole okay. different thing and I'll, I'll read a little section and I'll okay. end on reading a little section I'll tell you a little bit more about it there okay Okay, thank you for that. So let's talk about the writing life, which we already have. You've um, given us a glimpse into your writing life, which seems very, can I say, disciplined and full, because you're not just a writer, you are still very much a teacher, even though this gig has ended. Um, both are really demanding. Um, you also have family and friends and you know perhaps a social life occasionally going out well I'm a writer so not so much but yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so with finding your balance or still seeking your balance but it sounds like you you have found a pretty good balance to get this done um can you maybe offer some advice or insight into common traps aspiring writers may fall into when we try to honor our creative lives while also working and parenting and filling our lives with other demands. Yeah, well, I'll start by telling you, um, you know, we've got four kids and uh, now they're adults or, or just about there, right? We're trying to be. Um, but when I was doing all this, um, you know, when they were young, my husband bought me a set of traffic cones and um, and the idea was that I would put them outside my writing room and when they were outside nobody would bug me right and of course that was just an excuse for the kids to argue outside my door for, you know and bang on the door and things but you know that that sort of spells out what we're we're up or at, up against um, as a professional writer of course I work at home 
And so as anybody who works at home, and of course, recently, almost everybody was working at home, mm -hmm. knows uh, that makes it that much more difficult to put up the boundary between your work life and your family life. Uh, so, so it comes down to setting boundaries, right? Boundaries are everything. So again, I have my designated teaching days and designated writing days. And I try to my I try my very best to avoid looking at emails or social media in the morning um, because that's when I get my writing done. And I find if I look at emails or social media first thing in the morning, my morning is shot. Right? I, I don't have the focus to uh, to do my work. Um, so um, you know, but if I do avoid those emails and the social media first in the morning and get down to work quite early, uh, then I really get a lot done. So it's about uh, getting into the flow, getting to that that state. Um, so that's what I do to manage the the juggle. Is I, I make sure that I have uh, designated writing time and that I really stick to it. And I think that's really important. Um, the other thing too is uh, it, it took me a long time to feel that I had the right to have my writing time. And I think this is a problem more for probably women than it is for, for men because we do even now still tend to have more domestic demands on our time. And so again, you know, I, I had a really understanding family, um, but I still had to say, this is my writing time, leave me alone. And, and be okay to do that. And it took me quite a while to feel that it was okay to do that. So I think that's a big one is get to that point earlier than I did uh, to understand that you have a right to time for yourself. And if you choose to use um, that time to write, then feel good about that and, and make sure your family understands that and respects that. So I think those are the really big uh, things is, is to define your time and know that you have a right to it. You know um and that that it's okay yeah 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 I, I think a lot of people it's like even reading a book um mm -hmm. you know people feel apologetic about taking an hour to read a book that somehow that yeah. that's not a legitimate way to spend an hour so mm -hmm. but I wonder did you feel more um entitled as you know maybe not the right word but did you feel it was more okay to take your time to write a after you published your your first book um, and and b when you were shortlisted for like a, a finalist twice for the Gilda prize did you feel like you could and did your family think okay mom's actually got a real thing going on here she's published a lot of books and look she's got a really big prize that she might win um, well, I, I'm a farmer's daughter, right? So um, this is always a, a problem area. I mean, I was trained to work hard uh, and I was trained to work hard to make a living. And let's be honest, writing is not a way to make a living, right? Yeah. It's, uh, you know, I always joke that I don't know if I'm teaching to support my writing habit or if I'm writing to support my teaching habit, right? So it's, um, it's not an easy way to make a living. And I think uh, part of my problem was justifying the time if I wasn't actually making much from it. And, and that's true even if you have a successful book, because if you think about it, the, the time that goes into a successful book, you are never going to get that back. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're never going to recover it financially because it takes so long to write a book. Um, and so those are kind of the issues that go back and forth. So no, I, I don't think I ever felt easy about it, but I think I, I learned to come to, to the place where this is, this is part of who I am and that I have a right to it. And, um, and that's important. Right. And, and that's, and again, I wish I'd come to that place much earlier. So it, it was never the prize justified that. I never felt that at all or doing well. Success never uh, justified that. It was more, it was more, um, the, again, it was part of who I am. And so I learned to um, value that myself and demand that others valued it as well. So that was it. I don't think it, I don't think success ever makes it easier because success in this business doesn't mean monetary success it really doesn't uh, and, and are so, you still tied to 
you know, your young upbringing that success equals monetary success? Oh, oh, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying okay. that you, you, I never felt that I could justify the time uh, because. because of the sex success. But no, for me, uh, again, as a farmer's daughter, uh, monetary success never meant success. It was about, um, you know, uh, community and um, um, commitment to those around you. That's, that's real success. Oh, okay. Um, so Sorry. very, very different set of values there. No. Yeah. If I was chasing monetary success, I sure as hell wouldn't be a writer. Yeah. That. <laughs> you know, no, well, it's about, yeah, it, it's, about I, it's about, it's about clearly you've, you've reached many levels of sex success on very, uh, on very many levels, you know, including the readers that you have, have reached, um, which I think is a prize in itself. When you oh, it is. Leadership. And again, yeah. And again, yeah. that's about community building, right? Yes. It's about yeah. um, making connections and, you know, trying to use your skill to make positive change happen in whatever way yeah. you can. And, and that's often a struggle too, right? But that's, that's really what, what I hope to do is, um, you know, uh, give something back and leave the world a little better than we left it, you know, and that's really, uh, I think what most writers are trying to do is, is make that connection in some way, right, with, a, yeah. with the community out there. Um, do you recommend the, uh, the cones? to those who um, are writing with young kids was the, the traffic you know, cones <laughs> <the> traffic cones <laughs> well it only seemed to make them make more noise so i'm yeah. not sure but it but it did define it and say you know this is mom's time leave mom alone right yeah. so i so that and it was kind of a fun way to do it right yeah. putting out the traffic cones so so they yeah. sort of work but not really but yeah. yeah i think it was i edith blythe who i had read you know, she used to just swat her kids <laughs> So <laughs> when they came too close. So it might not have been her. I might be, but. Um, no, I didn't they, do that. But, you know, the, this. <laughs> so the traffic cones yeah, might be a better alternative. <laughs> yeah, my, my mom was, a, my mom was a writer and um, my kids write too. So, but with my mom, I can remember pulling on her pen because she was lost in her writing. And that, mm -hmm. that's a part of the writing life, right? You, yeah. you get into the flow, you become lost to it. And for kids, that can be really annoying, right? You know, you know I don't have mom's attention, right? Yeah. So, so I think that's, you know, something all of us have to kind of navigate is, uh, is finding that time to, to lose yourself in your writing. And, yeah. and you need quiet for that. You need a room for that. You need a place for that. And you need, the big thing is a habit. Uh, earlier, you said that, uh, you felt I was quite disciplined. I'm not. I don't believe in disciplining yourself as a writer. Uh, I think if you discipline yourself as a writer, then it's work. And you, your writing and creative brain does not like work, right? Uh, it, I often think of my writing and creative mind as a toddler. And we all know with a toddler, if you want to get you know a young child to clean up their room, you don't say, you must clean up your room. They're not going to do a damn thing. But if you take them by the hand and you make it a dance and you make it a party and you make it play and a game, then they'll do it, right? So it's the same with writing. It's, um, it's making it play. It's making it habit, but it's making it play and fun. And then you don't want to do anything else, right? Yeah. And that be it becomes something that you look forward to, that you enjoy, and, um, you know, that you just, you know, move into. That's not to say I don't have crappy writing days where, you know, I'm beating my head against the wall. I have those, but, but that's my approach that works. And um, if it's a job, whoa, you know, I don't want to do it, right? Yeah. Thank you for that clarification. Um, that's an important one. And also for putting that image in my head about it, um, you know, perhaps dancing towards the computer on the days um, and making it playful and fun. I think that's a beautiful image, especially for those of us who, um, who, who aren't making it a daily task um, to access that deeper creativity, which we know is so important um, because there's a million reasons why we can't. Um, and so thank you. Thank you for that clarification. And also for that beautiful imagery of making it a playful time that we're not um, butting heads with our creative side. I, yeah, you know, and I, and I did, you know, I did reach a point where it was work for me, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and again, that's that mid career thing that we all experience where, where it was no longer fun. And, uh, and I, the turning point for me was watching 
and recognizing that my kids weren't writing to to get published. They weren't writing to impress anybody. They weren't writing for awards. They weren't writing for work. They weren't writing for money. Uh, they were just writing because it was play, because it was fun. And I went, whoa, uh, I used to be like that. What happened? Right. Yeah. And, and that was a, a turning point for me where I went, okay, well, how can this be play again? Right. How can I, how can I enjoy it just for the sake of doing it again? And that was a real turning point for me. And when I started doing a lot of different things, um, which may not be great for my career, but they were good for my soul. And I think that's the key is to um, keep it playful, keep it fun, keep, uh, keep following your, your creative spirit rather than a market, right? Yes. Uh, and I think that's really important. Uh, thank you for that. And maybe you've answered this already, um, but you just sort of talked right now about rediscovering that writing is about process for you mm -hmm. and it's about finding your flow and losing yourself in the writing to the point that maybe your kids are you know having to poke you to get your attention um do you have advice or is there a specific ritual or one that you lean on um, or method to get yourself immersed in your actual writing like actually sit down and get your fingers on the keyboard um, to rediscover that playful, like, you know, that playful approach to um, rediscovering the love and the process of writing. Yeah, you know, it's, I always think of, you know, when I lived in Alberta, you just don't see this in BC, you know, the, um, the posts where you plug in your car to warm it up, mm -hmm. you know, in the winter. And um, I often think of it when we're sitting down to write, we, we need to plug ourselves in and warm ourselves up before we can kind of get going. And that, of course, is all about establishing habits. So, you know, a habit takes about three weeks to form. Um, so, uh, you know, start with a space, right? Make, making sure you have a space with a door that you can close. Uh, that's your established writing space. Uh, and I even define that even further. I have in my office uh, a Zoom area right here. Uh, I have uh, an area where it's all about administration. So it's about answering emails. It's about um, organizing my day, filling my calendar, looking at my calendar, all, all of that kind of thing. And then I have another space that's for the writing and creative end of it. Cool. And so because I have those defined spaces, when I sit down to my writing desk, my, my brain is already primed to go, okay, this is creative time here, right? Um, and so that's a big one, having a defined space that your brain associates with the writing process. And then I also keep a collection of books on my desk by other authors uh, that, again, um, prime the engine, you know, get it warmed up. So I'll start by reading little bits of very different writers. So, so I'm, you know, not trying to copy them in a way. It's just, just to get my, my reading and, and writing brain growing. And a big thing is I'll decide on the scenes that I'm going to write the night before. And I'll do whatever research is necessary. I'll do my spider drawings, brainstorming uh, the night before. Uh, so that overnight my subconscious is at work and it can play around with the ideas uh, to the point that I'll often wake in the night as I did last night with ideas, right? And I'll have to jot them down. So that when I sit down to write in the morning, the uh, scenes will be there for me. And that, that's a really useful trick. And again, this is why I avoid emails and social media in the morning, you know, because otherwise that'll just break that. I, and again, I talked about it earlier, having uh, building in physical activity into the day so that, um, you know, I'll take a noon hour walk and it's there where ideas will percolate up. And, um, and another one, this is, this is sliding into too much information territory, but one of the places where I habitually have the best ideas is in the shower. That's going back to that three Bs, you know, the bedroom, the bath and the, and the bus. And so I'll often end my writing day with a shower because it's in that place, that state, that um, the really good ideas that I'll use the next day will percolate up and I'll have to write them down. So I, I think every writer has their tricks um, for getting themselves into the flow. 
But again, it does come down to habit. It comes down to mastery because flow is all about mastery. So learning your craft and uh, learning how to do it to the point where uh, you enter into it and reach that flow state, um, which is wonderful. And it's really the reason I write is that flow state where I lose my sense of self and sense of time. And ultimately that's the real reason I write and it leaves you with a sense of um, mastery and a sense of deep satisfaction that will often last for hours afterwards. So it's, um, so it's a wonderful, deeply meditative state uh, to be in. And it's extraordinary when you are able to do that every day, um, as most writers will know, yeah. Okay, well, I, um, you have sold me on um, <laughs> reevaluating my life as a writer and maybe putting some more effort into it. Um, what an inspiration just this last 50 minutes of speaking with you um, and just being able to get to pick your brain for like just a small part of it. Um, what a brain you have and um, what a gift you have with sharing what you have learned through your writing career um, so far. And, you know, there's still more to come. So yeah, thank you for, you know, it, and it's sometimes just even small small changes like you just shared about having three different places in your workroom to work I love the fact of of separating my emails and my you know and then just moving my computer over to someplace else and that just being where I write um I'm going to do that so thank you um can we end our hour with one more reading from you Sure. Yeah. So, I'll, yeah. So I mentioned I, um, I'm just going to read from um, my next domestic thriller, um, The Almost Widow. Uh, again, it's very different story, different characters. Uh, the only thing that's similar are the, um, is the title. Uh, and the story follows Piper, who's an environmentalist and whose life falls apart after her husband disappears. And I'm just going to read the short uh, chapter one, just to give a flavor of it. Uh, the setting is very different again. I'm back in the Pacific uh, Northwest. So back here in BC, not too far from where we live in the Shushwap. And uh, again, just give you a flavor of the, uh, the spooky, um, you know, temperate rainforest atmosphere and uh, a sense of the uh, novel. Someone was watching me. I could feel it. That tingle you get at the back of your neck between the shoulder blades. I scanned the dim misty forest behind me, the skunk cabbage along Hunter's Creek, the western hemlock strewn with witch's hair, the moss covered and impossibly large trunks of the towering red cedars, the ferns sheltering the mossy forest floor at their roots. I saw no one, though the unsettling feeling persisted. Someone was watching me. But then there was always someone watching within this temperate rainforest, a chickadee, crow, cougar, black bear, or a grizzly. I put a hand to the bear spray on the belt holster at my hip. A huge cinnamon colored grizzly, a sow had stalked my husband Ben through this forest earlier in the fall, though on the far shore of the lake, likely the same bear that had mauled a young woman to death there the previous summer. Ben and Jackson had never been able to catch the animal. The baited traps they had set within a couple of weeks of each incident had been hauled away, so they didn't attract other bears or cougars to the area, where the few tourists who ventured this far off the beaten track went for hiking and bouldering. The cinnamon grizzly with a taste for hunting humans was still out there. I shook off the thought as I turned back to the giant stump I just discovered and snapped off a few photos of it with my phone to share on social media when I caught some bars. There was no, no cell reception out here. The stump of an old growth red cedar was inflicted with heart rot as so many of the elderly, elderly trees were. Aside from the mound of waste branches left behind, most of the wood of the fallen tree had been bucked into rounds and split into blocks small enough to be hauled away, likely for cedar shakes. Thousands and thousands of dollars worth of cedar shakes. That tree had survived hundreds of years, storms and fires, and then a century more of logging within this rare inland rainforest. 
It had been a giant, an ancient, an old soul alive in a way my punny human mind would never fully comprehend. And now senselessly it was dead. Only so some homeowner could slap cedar shakes on their house or keep the weeds at bay in their garden with cedar moats. Shit. I knelt in front of the stump and wrapped my arms around it as far as they would go, which wasn't far. The stump was massive. To anyone watching, it would have seemed like a child in comparison. The cut wood pressed against my cheek felt like the bristle of Ben's freshly trimmed beard as I lay in his arms, prickly, comforting, familiar, home. But then I again felt eyes on me as I had so many times in these woods. It might have been a deer or even a grizzly, but no, I knew it wasn't. It was the Bushman. I stood scanning the shadows in the thick, lush understory beneath the hemlock and cedars. Who's there? I yelled. I know you're there. I know you've been watching me. Not just this day, but at other times. Show yourself. And then, only meters from me, a thread of mist swirled away, revealing a dark green shadow of a man before he backed up silently on the mossy forest floor, disappearing into the gloom. But I know, knew he was still watching me. What do you want? I shouted after him. Who are you? In response, there was only another stirring in the mist, the shift of branches and leaves as the wind rippling through the forest brought with it the chill of snow heralding the turn of the season into winter. So there, a little taste of that one. Hmm. I'm just transporting myself back to Calgary. <laughs> Thank you for that little trip. So the Almost Widow is out with Harper Collins in a year, next spring? Uh, next spring, yeah. Next spring. Yeah. Yep. All right, we shall look for that. Uh, if you want to know more, about Gail Anderson Dargatz, because you have been as excited as I have from this interview, I invite you to check out her website where you can discover the 20 pub, almost 20 publications um, that she, well, that she has written. Um, and Gail also offers to, ways to continue to work with her. Um, and then also, she also offers on her um, website free re resources and blogs on craft. So find yourself there and see what else Gail has to offer in terms of the writing craft. You can find Gail at www.gailanderson-dargats.ca. It has been a beautiful hour of conversation about all things writing and about um, what happens in, well, specifically in your mentorship program, but for those who have never um, ventured into taking advantage of a writer in residence, I thank you for everything that you shared today. Um, it has been a rich hour. And so this concludes our conversation and I'd like to thank you on behalf of the Writers Guild of Alberta. Well, thank you and thank you, Lisa.